Good morning. Welcome here. May long weekend, 2023. And you guys can all count yourselves really blessed you're not sleeping in a tent. Some are. Hope they're enjoying themselves. So um, <clears throat> this week as, as we're preparing for, um, for church to lead you guys in worship to, to, to God our, and Jesus our Savior, um, what comes to mind? And I started thinking, what should, what should we sing? What should we do? And, and the, my thoughts went to George and Bertha and uh, uh, Merlin, who was having surgery. And who do we lean on? Who do we trust when things go out of our control? They're not really in our control to, in the first place, but, you know, we have this feeling like we're in control. And so that is kind of the, the theme that... Uh, that I went with, and uh, yeah, so if you want to, oh, I'm losing my notes here, if you want to stand, I invite you to do that, and we're going to sing Blessed Assurance. <clears throat> Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Spirit washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love, this is my story. Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior.
is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the same Scripture today, I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians. I think I say this every time, but familiar verses, I think they fit well. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory far that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. <clears throat> 262, if you're following in a hymn book. Simply trusting every day. Trusting stormy way even when my faith is small trusting Jesus that is all trusting as the moments fly trusting as the days go by trusting him whatever I believe in the 
time since I've been up here, not at this pulpit, but I've been in pulpits before, and I uh, haven't preached in about 20 years. So I'm going to be sharing, and it's going to be a little difficult, because um, the last two weeks our family had experienced a loss, the passing of my sister, and she was my best friend. And yesterday we were preparing for her funeral. And I remember one of the things that my sister said to me, she knew I was preaching this Sunday, and she was excited. And she said, Lori, I want you to remember something. When you are going to talk about Jesus, make it exciting, because our Lord lives. And she said, I'm tired of people who preach, and they don't have the excitement of God in them. And uh, her husband, Bill, is here with us, my mom and dad, so I hope that, uh, you know, he knows her well enough to know how she was like. 
Um, I appreciate, Mark, the music you chose there, fantastic. And there was a theme throughout that whole beautiful numbers, and that was hope, that we have hope in God, that we have hope in Christ. And I am going to get a little emotional from time to time. I hope you guys don't mind, because I'm an emotional preacher. And um, one of the things that have been bothering me for a long time has been the slow death of our Christian church, especially in North America. How we are turning away from Christ and how we are letting cultural influence impact who we are as a, as a core group. And as I was preparing this, I was lamenting this. I was, it bothered me. I said, like, God, what are we going to do? And what can we do? So when Pastor Ron invited me up here, I knew I was going to share my testimony. There are going to be some things said in my testimony. I'm not going to get into any detail. You don't need to know all the details. You don't need to know what color my socks were or anything like that. But there will be some details that will make you feel uncomfortable. Not, not too detailed. But um, we need to know where we come from. And as I was preparing this, the most of the passages of Scripture will be found in the book of Nehemiah. And that's important. Because Nehemiah is a significant passage. They're talking about the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. And prior to this, Israel going through from the very beginning of Genesis all the way through the first and second chronicles and into first and second kings, you see Israel would have these moments of coming up and then bam, it would fall down. Oop, about to drop that. And it was routinely like this. Most of the time, if any of you read the Old Testament, you're going to find that there's mostly down stuff. This king wasn't very good. This king wasn't very good. This king wasn't very good. And you get these little moments where this, this King Josiah in Isaiah chapter 6, he did something great. And you go, oh, thank goodness for that. But most of the time, in the Old Testament, it's downer. And so I'm thinking about Moses. And as I was preparing this, I wanted to find a way to share about Moses. Because here's Moses. He did not want to do this. He did not want to lead Israel. And God is demanding him to do it. And so in the book of Deuteronomy, and I love the book of Deuteronomy. Because when we talk about Sinai, we talk about the Ten Commandments. Moses spent 40 days up there. And we think that he only spent that time writing the Ten Commandments. He didn't. He spent a great deal of that time writing the very structure of what the rules and regulations were for Israel. And he didn't do so because he wanted to put rules and a lot of stuff that we had to obey as a, some arbitrary decision. He did this because he knew, God knew, that Israel was not going to have access to medical help. And he knew that they were not going to have access to cleaning mildew from their walls. Because that's interesting. Look at Durham. It talks about what to do when there's mildew on your walls. And he knew, God knew, that he had to get these instructions to Israel. And what does Moses do after he, he delivers it? He shares it. This is what's going to happen. This is what you need to do. If you want to stay thriving, if you want to be a nation of people, and I want you to be, you need to be a beacon, a light to all nations. And this we said. And he's... And Moses then says one of the hardest words that I've ever read, Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 29, he says to Israel, you will fall. Clear as day. He's not saying you could fall. He says you will fall. And when it happens, you'll be destroyed. Your fortresses will be gone. You will live in lands and languages that you do not understand. You will follow gods and idols that do not belong to you. And he sends this message of, almost a horrific message. And I read that, I was like, where's our hope? If Israel can't get this right, how come, how are we expected to get this right? And I'm looking at today's society, I'm going, somehow or another, we're going to have to get this right. Because somehow or another, we've lost our way. So, Moses says, in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, there will be a remnant, a small number, and I will call them out. And you will be found dispersed all over in various nations. And I'm going to call you out. And you're going to come. And the walls will be restored. And you will be bigger than what you were before. And I find great comfort in that. So I'm going to share my testimony. And then I'm going to go into the passage of Nehemiah. And then after that, I'm going to almost be doing bullets with Scripture all over the place. I hope you guys don't mind. 
I come from a difficult family. And my dad just gave me the look. Yeah, yeah. My brother and I, and it's going to be difficult for me to share. My brother and I come from a sexually abused situation. And we were sexually abused from the age of three to the age of ten by three uncles. And my brother remembers more of the details than I do. So he, him and I were talking a few months ago about this. And he said, you don't remember this? He said, I don't remember a lot of it. So from the age of three and ten, I learned that I wasn't a person, that I was rather an object. And that was difficult. And then at the age of ten, and I think I left it back there. I have, a, I forgot it. I was at Faraday School, and we had a book fair. And uh, there was a little Bible in a book, you know, little book fairs. You know those things that you see in the malls. You get these books for 50 cents or a dollar or whatever. I bought this little Bible for 25 cents, and I took it home. And I'm, I was an odd little boy because I remember at Christmas times I would ask for Santa to give me a Bible. <laughs> and it was kind of, you know, how many other kids do you know would ask for a Bible at Christmas time? So I bought this little Gideon Bible, little red covers there in the back. And I read it, and in the first pages, it talked about a story about a child, the age of 12, 13, who became Christian, fell in love with Jesus. So that night, I went to, before I went to bed, I went on my knees and I accepted Jesus in my heart. And I did that almost every night for about six, seven months, because in my mind, every time you sin, you're going to need to ask God for forgiveness again and again and again, because every time you sin, you're losing grace, right? That's what I thought. So then I would, I did that. Now, I'm going to be saying something here difficult. I hope that my dad doesn't mind, but my mom was a very brutal person. And um, so when I was going through this period of adjustment and learning to love God, my mom would focus her anger towards me. So for two years, while I'm trying to share with my mother how much Jesus loves, I said, my mom loved God. Make no mistake about it. She did. And uh, I tried to tell her, and she got angry, and she would beat me. And so by the time I was 12, 13, because I was by myself during this journey, I lost my faith. And at the age of 12, 13, I had fallen into atheism and occultism, and then later into Satanism. And so from the age of 13 to 15, I had practiced self-harm, and I had done terrible, terrible things to myself. And God's amazing. It's just like Israel. You know, Israel has these moments of ups and then downs. And they last a while. And then you get these moments of ups. And then you get some more downs. And that's what happened here. Because at the age of 14 and 15, and I was starting to despair. I was starting to feel terrible. I didn't love God. And God doesn't love me. And I don't even know who God is anymore. Harry Burns, family member, family friend, with his wife, came to our house. And they shared the gospel message again. And their church, I believe, was in Ness Avenue, if I, if I can't remember exactly. And uh, he had told me later that him and his congregation had prayed for us. They had brought our names to the, to the church to pray for us regularly. And I remember our whole family became Christian. Uh, so for me, it was like a second time. And then my mom and my dad and my brother and my sister all became Christians at that time. And for a while, it was good. It was very good. So there was one of those up moments again. And then I went to Bible college. I spent four years in Bible college. And I was uh, in, in Albright Memorial Church is where we were attending. I had become a, a youth leader uh, as, a, as being, part of this, uh, being part of the youth. But I was the guy who was one of the, I don't know, one of the leaders of the youth group. So we did a lot of stuff together. And I learned, got refined. My discipleship was through Pastor Lucas Van Bush, my pastor. We would get together two, three times a week for months, and we would go through the Word of God together. So I was being built up. But something happened when I was three to ten years old. Something was planted in my head, and I wasn't aware of it. And it was, it was, it, it was something I couldn't understand, um, a mental problem, a mental illness what had crept in. And it was an unrealized problem at that time. And I didn't know it. But I would t every time I would be with wrong people, I would always feel like I was not a, a part of the group. I would always feel like I was a loner. I had to be separate from everybody, so I never really connected with anybody. And that was because I always felt like I didn't belong, never belonged. 
And it, for a long time, it just existed. And I would follow the faith, but I would go to Bible college. And I remember I would be in the Bible college. I'd get so involved with the classes. But when I got home to the dorm, I would cry. Almost every night, I'd be crying, God, where are you? It was like that over and over again. And then I met my wife, Roseanne, and then had my children. And it just, it just kept on. It was a slow drop. It wasn't one of those big slams to the ground. It was like a slow, cascading, slow drop. I was struggling with something in my head that I couldn't figure out because of the abuses of the child. And I was also dealing with um, the consequences of being involved with occultism, which I was unrealized at the time as well. So I abused my wife for a number of years early in our marriage, and then later on when our kids were born, I abused them. And I was not a very good man. And then around 2006, it, it just plummeted. I fell completely from grace at that time. I went full on into occultism, full on into Satanism. I won't go into details, you don't need to know the details. And I went full on into self-harm. I was a regular at hospitals. I remember in my neighborhood, every time there was a siren, they said, what did Lori do this time? And then my neighbors, they would talk amongst themselves because I was always doing something terrible to myself. And then something happened. In 2009, I had, I don't know how many times I tried to commit suicide, I lost count. But the last time I tried to commit suicide was in July 1st, 2009. I was determined. I was tired. I couldn't do this anymore. I wanted out. So I did everything in my power. I won't go into details what I did, but that night I was determined to kill myself. And my wife and my children were out at fireworks. And my poor family had to find me practically dead in my bed with vomit hanging out of my mouth. And then I went to the hospital and I was in a coma for five to six years, or not five to six weeks, uh, days. That would be amazing, five to six years. It was only five to six days. Well, Roseanne said it was shorter. I don't remember most of the time. Um, but what I found out when I came out, and it, there was a, long, a lot of stuff that happened when that happened. When I came out, my doctor came in, and he said, you know, you have a blood poisoning in your body. You're septic. You have sepsis. And in, I, that must have been caused by my suicide attempt. He said, no, that's had nothing to do with your suicide attempt. He said, you were dying. He said to me straight out, if you had not tried to commit suicide, you'd be dead. I was like, so am I trying to kill myself, save my life? I can't even get that right. I'm thankful to God for that. But then, now this is key. Something happened in the coma, and I don't know if you guys believe in visions or anything like that. I, it could be a dream. It could be whatever. But when I was in the coma, I saw a lot of things. And it was, it was interesting. And one of the things I saw was very similar to what Nehemiah had to do. So I'm going to say what God showed me, and then I'm going to read you the passage from the book of Nehemiah. And don't worry, I'm mindful of the clock. Um, when I was in the coma, I was... And this, you have to remember that I am suffering through some kind of a mental problem, and I was unrealized, and I didn't know what it was. And I am looking at a house, and I see a feet, and these are God's feet. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to see God, but I can see God's feet, and I can see his hands. I was like, okay, what are we doing? And I didn't know where we were going. He said, I want you to go upstairs. I want you to go to the attic. So I go up to the attic, and I see a carpet, and it's the most awful-looking carpet I had ever seen in my life. It was, imagine the most awful colors, like pink and oranges and browns. Browns are really ugly color. And there was other, you know, lime green. You know, imagine the most awful colors mixed together. I'm going, this is, this is an ugly carpet. And then all of a sudden, I see this all. And he says, I want you to take this all. And I put on a thread on that carpet. And I want you to unravel it. And I said, okay. It's a long way. Why don't we just take a, a pair of scissors, a utility knife, just cut the thing out, just put a new one in. I couldn't have figured that out. And I want you to unravel it, and I want you to gather it into a big ball. That's what he said. I said, okay, I'm going to gather it. He said, it's going to be hard. You're going to have to get some sticky spots or some gunk in there. You're going to have to... 
deal with that. It's going to hit the wall. It's going to cause some troubles. It's going to be troubles here, here, there. It's not going to be easy, but you're going to do it. And so I gathered this ball of thread. And then it took a wall. And then after it was done, I'm looking at this giant ball sitting in the middle of an attic, and there was no floor anymore. I'm saying, oh, good, we got the ball done, so that means we can go and scrape the floor. We can take the floor out and put some new flooring in and then put some flooring in and put the new carpet in. He said, no, I want you to take a scraper. You're going to scrape the gunk off the floor, and we're going to reuse that thread because that's who you are. And I didn't, I was, what? That's who you are. There is nothing wrong with you. It's what you've done with your life that's wrong. Everything, all the mismatch of colors, that's the mess you made. That's the stuff you did, and I'm here to fix it. That's what he told me. I'm here to fix it. So I come out of the hospital after being in there for, I don't know, it must have been about a week, and I remember the first time I walked outside, and my wife can attest to this, I felt like it was brand new day, and I was scared. I'm walking, I'm going, I don't know if I want to be out here. And everything looked different, and the light was bright, and I'm looking at people, and I said, I don't know if I want to see these people. And I'm looking at cars, I don't know if I want to go into a car. I don't know, what, do I want to do this? I don't know. It was scary. I felt like a new baby all over again. And then after that, I went and talked to my doctor. My poor doctor, he had to go through this whole thing with me, and he would see the stuff I had done. He goes, Lori, if you keep doing this, you're going to die. And he would get so mad at me. And then the last time he saw me, after I came out of the hospital, he goes, what happened to you? I said, what? He said, you got a smile on your face. I've never seen that before. And then he said, what happened to you? And I said to him, I don't know. I just feel different. And then he said, um, I told him what happened, told him the stuff that happened to me as a kid. And he said, we're going to have to get you in. So after I got out of the hospital, I spent eight years in therapy to deal with the stuff that I had to do. And there was a lot of scraping and there was a lot of twirling to get that big ball of thread together. And then after that, I had to go, because I abused my wife and I abused my children, I had to go through the Evolve program in clinic. I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard of that. But the Evolve program is a program for men who are abusive. And it's a place where men learn why they're abusive and how to stop. So I went through that program for a year, graduated. And then after I went through the program, I became a peer counselor slash counselor aide to the one who ran the program. And I worked with other men who were abusive for two to three years afterwards. It was scary. And now I understood why God wanted me to gather that thread. And the unrealized problem in my head was because I struggled with disassociative personality disorder. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that term. But it is a modern term for multiple personality. And when I was going through the abuse between the age of three and ten, I created different environments so that I wouldn't have to feel what was happening to me at that time. I would play with a doll and imagine something else. And then I'd live there until everything was done. And I didn't realize I had carried that with me. And my counselor, my doctor told me. Also, I had become an addict. So I remember one of the things my doctor told me, he said when they were diagnosing me, I was on 15 to 20 different medications. So they were trying to figure out how to fix this problem, and they kept on piling on more medication, but not removing others, so pretty soon I'm an addict to all these medications. And my doctor tells me, <laughs> I said, so what medication am I going to be able to take while I'm going through this whole program? He says, Laura, you're not taking any medication. You're off of it. And if you go to a dentist, and you, I remember going to the dentist, having to get a wisdom tooth removed, and I said, so I get my Tylenol 3s, and he looked at my medical chart, he goes, no, you're not allowed any of that. You're done. You're not allowed any more medication. So I had to learn to trust in God pretty quick. And now I want to read the passages of Nehemiah. And I want you to remember that all of us have struggles. So some people have it really bad. They got big struggles. And some people have little struggles. There's no such thing as a little struggle. Every struggle is a struggle. And it's hard. And it's going to wear you out. And it's going to wear you down. And in some cases, you're going to give up. You're going to want to give up. And Moses had just warned Israel that I'm going to restore you. After this whole thing happens, I'm going to restore you. So here in the book of Nehemiah, and I, I'm going to get emotional here because these, these passages mean a lot to me. So I'm going to read first from chapter 1 of Nehemiah 1 to 7. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, 
came from Judah with some men. Now you have to remember, Ezra had already come to Israel and was rebuilding the temple. He had started that project 50 years before Nehemiah is called to build on the wall. So God had already started the good work to restore Jerusalem. He says to me, those who survived the exile, oh, pardon me, I, and one of my brothers came from Judah with some men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile. Again, fulfillment of the prophecy that Moses had given. And also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. The prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands and decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. So the first thing Nehemiah does when he's aware that this is happening, that there's something happening, the remnants are coming back to Jerusalem, but they're still struggling because they're feeling, facing oppression. There are other people who are occupying Jerusalem at this time, and he's lamenting, dear God, please restore us. And so at this point, I don't think he knows what he's going to do. So he's praying to God, help me figure out what I'm going to do. What am I supposed to do? He's a regular person just like us. Just a regular person just like us. So in chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, something wonderful happens. In the month of Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever? Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? And I prayed to the God of heaven. This is incredible. This is important, guys. He, he has an opportunity. God has presented him an opportunity. And Nehemiah must have been vibrating. Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. And the king says, then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It, it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. That's boldness. That is incredible boldness. But that doesn't mean there isn't any obstacle, because he's now facing a nation that was once his and now belongs to someone else. And he's going to be rebuilding a wall that the enemies of God are going to go, what is happening? And they're going to try to block and, and cause that to stumble. And I'm going to try to make this faster because I know I'm running out of time here. In the chapter 2, verse 11 to 20, he says, I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out before the night with a few men. And this part I get emotional about. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on by night, and it had to be by night because they were facing opposition. By night I went through the valley gate, through the jackal wall, well, and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire, then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, for there was not enough room for, me, for my mouth to get through. It was so destroyed that the whole colonnade was covered in debris. There is no standing stone in Jerusalem at this point. So I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and I re-entered through the valley gate 
the visit officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. And I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them upon the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king has said to me. They replied, I love this part, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. One thing that we have to remember here, God did not give them new stone. And I want that to sink in. These are fragments and small pieces all over the place. And God would, did not provide them with any new stone. He provided them with timber. That's what King Artaxerxes said. I will provide you with timber to rebuild the gates, but I am not, he would not give him stone or rock. And to this day, if you go look, the Jews in Jerusalem celebrate that wall to this day because they built it without rock, new rock. And it stood, it stood. And now opposition, last portion of Nehemiah, Chapter 4, 6 to 15. This part I love. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of, men of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that their gaps were being closed, they were very angry. These are the enemies of God. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. There's so much rubble. Also, our enemy said, before they, come, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore I stationed, this is amazing. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posted them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. That is what we're facing in today's world. I'm, I, am, I have been lamenting North American Christianity. I'm going to consult my notes here. As I wrote them down, I'm gonna probably forget some of them. Um, Pardon me. Yes, here it is. There's some statistics here. I was reading from Pew Research, and I, the numbers are alarming, and I was lamenting. According to Pew Research, the biblical worldview, only 30% of evangelical Christians believe in the biblical worldview. Now, and those numbers are dropping, which means that we believe the Word of God is the inerrant Word of God, and it is our life standard, like Moses who provided the laws to Israel, this is our life standard, and we are, we are letting culture and politics and even spiritual division determine what our beliefs are, and it should be found within the biblical worldview, but it's squandering, and within, that's evangelicals. The numbers for Protestants, other Protestants, 
Catholics, um, liberals, the numbers are down to 10, 15%. State of the church, they exit, there's, a, there's a tremendous exodus of people leaving the church. Believers are becoming discontented and they want to disobey God. Many are abandoning the faith. People are making excuses why they're not openly behaving as Christians. They're afraid. The wall has fallen down. And I asked God, as I was preparing this, you know, what are we supposed to do? And there is a solution. And we have to want it. Because if we always say this, one of the things that bothers me, and I do look forward to the second coming of Christ. Make no mistake about it. The second coming of Christ is extremely important, and I'm looking forward to it. But when you, as a Christian person, uh, that's the only thing you're looking at is the second coming of Christ, or the only thing you're looking at is the, the tribulation that you're going to have that's going to come forward, if that's all you're thinking about, you're in trouble. Because that's not what our job is. And we've lost sight of what our job is. And what the other thing about is, is that we're not lamenting that the wall has fallen down. We need to, to gird each other up, celebrate God, claim God's promises, and do what God wants us to do. And it's not hard. I'm going to start doing my bullet Bible readings, so follow along. And it's going to be, I'm going to try to do this. I have them marked on my Bible. I have number one, number eight, number five, and I'm looking for number one. Forgive me. We're going to go to Matthew 25. No, not that one. That's not it yet. I think I've lost my place. No, that is Matthew 25. Okay, we got it right. I'm going to read Matthew 25, 1 to 13. I think I've got a bit of time yet. I think I'll be good. Okay. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in the jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready with him ready, went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. And Isaiah, is that Isaiah? Yeah. I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. This is, if we want to know why you're here, what our job is. Isaiah 49, 6 says this. He says, and this is awesome, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant. It is too small a thing to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. God chose us to be his people with our decision to accept our Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the mediator between God and man, and the Son of God, as well as God in the flesh. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we go about doing this? How many of us do what Paul says? Work out your faith with fear and trembling. How many of us spend time and do the inventory? God, am I truly doing what you want us to do? And I had to go through that in the hospital. It was hard because God basically, we're going to have to fix this. We're going to have to fix it now. Luke chapter 10, 2 to 3. And I'm, here we go. Luke chapter 10, verse 1 to 3. After this is a good one. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place 
where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Take up your cross. Matthew 10, verses 38 to 39. It says this. This is interesting. You get one of the first references of the cross. Jesus is still alive. And here you got a reference to the cross while Christ is among them. And he says this. Anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. People always read that. They go, well, that means we're going to take up the cross and carry Jesus Christ. But the disciples who heard this had no idea what he was saying. They knew that the cross was a bad thing, that the Romans used this as a form of punishment. It was like, what do you mean take up your cross? It was something that he had warned them about, almost like he was saying, listen to my words, keep them in your heart. These are going to have significance later. John 14 12 to 14. Oh, I, I, I'm, uh, those who are following along, they must be really quick in their fingers. Uh, 12 to 14 says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I'll do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Of course, some of us are going to go, well, I'd like a new car, I'd like to have some money, I'd like to have some security, and all that kind of thing. That's not what God's talking about here. He's talking, if you're going to do my will, I will provide you with everything you need. So don't look at this as some sort of selfish motivation, because it is not. This is God saying, I will give you the courage to do what you got to do, I will give you the strength to be able to do it, and I'll give you the support to help you do it. Have confidence. Oh, this is. Have confidence that God will help us succeed in doing his will. Have the confidence of Nehemiah and of Ezra and of Zerubbabel who came before him. Be found building God's kingdom. And God will give you strength and power and encouragement. He will provide you with his eternal grace and holiness. And I'm going to, or you're, I've got a couple more verses, and I'm going to take a look here at the book of James, chapter 2. Book of Straw. That's what Luther called this book. He didn't like it very much. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith that has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, one of you says to him, go, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed, but does nothing good, or pardon me, does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. Are we exhibiting a livelihood that Christ wants us to exhibit? Are we determined to do what God wants us to do to rebuild the wall? Or are we just going to lament and feel sad? Say this is over. I'm looking for the second coming of Christ. I'm, 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 I'm punching out. I'm just living for the second coming of Christ. That's it. That's all I'm thinking about right now. That's not what we're supposed to be thinking about. And that's what God was telling me when I was going through my healing, and going through the stuff in my head. He said, we, 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 we're going to take this thread and we're going to rebuild it because I want you to be a beacon. I want you to be an example to other people. It's not just for yourself. It's for, for God's glory. And Nehemiah, he's being called to rebuild the wall. And it's not just for himself. It's not just so that he can restore the, his family's good name. And it wasn't just because he wanted to get Israel back onto the, into the playing ground, get back into the, you know, get onto the field again, because he knew that God wanted Israel to be a beacon to all the nations. And not just to his, the nations of Israel, but to the Gentiles. It is no small thing, he says, to do just that. I want you to be a light to the Gentiles so that my salvation goes all through the world. And we've lost sight of that. 
And I lament it. I thought about that. I was thinking about my life. Okay, why would God restore me? Why would God restore me? What's the point of this? God wants us to be put to work. God wants to restore all of us. God wants us to be wanting to share the gospel message to your friends, to your neighbors, to everybody, because that's the thing. Missionaries are not just those people we send out. Missionaries are here. We are the missionaries. We are his hands. We are his feet. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, it says this. I, I, love, I love all these verses. <laughs> Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Just like Mark. Beautiful. Love it. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The one thing I always love about that verse is that it says, Be filled by the Holy Spirit. It is not a one-time thing. The actual translation means to be continually filled by the Holy Spirit. When you're down and you don't feel like you have enough energy and you don't think you can do that, what God's asking you to do, God will tell you, take a break. There's times that God says, take a break. But then he'll provide you with the Holy Spirit again and again and again. All you have to do is want it. And there's where your strength is. It's found in the Holy Spirit. The acts of God that were once celebrated by Christians worldwide, and this is true, I actually had some conversations with people the last three weeks. The acts of God that were once celebrated by Christians worldwide has now become subjects of ridicule and suspicion. Words like revival, salvation, conversion, and the light have become words that offend many Christians. Never mind the secular world. Thousands are being saved by current revivals that are happening around the globe. Hope I didn't drop that. Good. But here in North America, they are met with suspicion and political motivation. The salvation of these people are seen as opposed to basic human rights and conversion as an act of hatred and bigotry. Who are we to decide God's methods? It says in the Word of God, we shall know them by their fruit. But now we are calling this fruit hatred. I'm going to conclude with a couple of passages of Scripture, actually one, Psalm 85. And then I'm going to read the lyrics of a song that was from the 1980s. I'm old, and I like 1980s music. So forgive me. My children, they go, oh, no, not again. It's like, yep, we're going to put on the old 1980s music, and you're going to like it. Psalm 85. And I'm going to read the whole thing. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins, Salah. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. And I'm going to get emotional here. Restore us again, O Lord, our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you, showing us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation? I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs, springs forth from the earth. Righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. John chapter 9, one of the most, my most favorite passages of Scripture, it's misunderstood. 
And I was reading it last night, and I got very emotional reading it. And so I'm going to read it here, chapter 9, verse 4 to, 4 to 5. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming. When no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. There's a song written by Steve Camp. I'm not sure you guys ever heard of Steve Camp. Anybody out there ever listened to Steve Camp? There's a few people that know Steve Camp. That's good. I'm very old. <laughs> this is a very this is back in the day where songs had a little bit of clout. And this is what it says in this song. And I'm going to get emotional. We've turned from your ways, Lord. Your fruit we've ceased to bear. We lack the power we once knew in our prayers. That gentle voice from heaven we cease to hear and know. The fact that he has risen no longer stirs our souls. Though we've been unfaithful, we've never been disowned. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead compels us to his throne. Revive us, O oh Lord. Revive us, O oh Lord. And cleanse us from our impurities and make us holy. Hear on cry and revive us, O oh Lord. And that's what I gained when I came out of the hospital on June 9th, 2009. That love. I have never gone back to occultism, never went back to atheism. And that wall that Nehemiah rebuilt still stands today. God is here and is always here, waiting for us to ask him for his help. If we want to do the will of God, all we need to do is ask him for his help and he will provide it. He'll even provide the strength and the courage to want it, to return to his love, to come back to faith, and to rebuild our spiritual wall. We just have to want it bad enough, like how Nehemiah and Ezra wanted it bad enough, the way Zerubbabel wanted it bad enough. And I pray that we all want to rebuild our wall and to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ everywhere without fear, with all our heart. And that we want it bad enough. Dear Lord in heaven, I love you. I thank you for what you did. I thank you for this congregation. This church loves you, God. Give us the strength, O oh Lord, to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Help us to be reminded how much you love us and how much you love others. And Father, when we go forward, help us to remember that we're going to laugh, we're going to have a good time, and I, we need that. We need to laugh, we need to be goofballs, we need to do all those things, O oh Lord. But in all of that, we also need to remember that we need to do the work of God. And I pray, Father, that I do not insult you. I mean that. That I do not insult you by, give, by you giving me this chance. And I pray, Father, that I would not squander it. As I thank you, Father, that Nehemiah, Ezra, Zerubbabel did not squander it. May you be praised and glorified, O Father, in everything we say and do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I've got some paper on the floor. I have to pick it up later. Um, I'd like to quote a song, too. It's a little bit newer than the one. I've heard the name, but I don't know the song. Um, Casting Crowns. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody saved my soul. If you'd like to stand, I invite you to do that. We're going to uh, close the service today.
with 272, The Solid Rock.